Oh my gosh, that's a great question. Um, I think that my, so I grew up a Midwestern, you know, high school kid who had not really seen a ton of the world. We traveled a bunch as a kid, but I hadn't been down to the country other than I think maybe into Canada once. We didn't really travel abroad or anything like that. So um, joining the military really uh, changed my perspective on cultures around the world, on uh, how governments work, on what causes people to get angry and want to fight one another as far as government to government and military to military. But I didn't really have a good um, perspective on until I joined the military, right? Uh, I gained a ton of great knowledge on on other people's cultures and what makes people tick and why people are the way they are. As, and as spoken as when I say people, I mean large groups of people, not really individuals, right? But uh, to gain good influence and an understanding of of what America is and and what how America is looked at by our friends abroad, by our enemies abroad, and why, I think is really eye opening because we get, you know, I didn't grow up in this old twenty four hour news cycle that wasn't the way it was back in the nineteen eighties, but we had this uh, news a couple times a day. We had uh, three channels unless you had cable, three local network channels, but um, now it's being fed down our throats and our kids' throats, and we get this whole sense of 24 hours a day, whereas for me, it was really eye-opening, and, and uh, you get greater appreciation and, and understanding of, of, of how America is viewed on the world stage and, and how what we do makes a difference, right? Uh, I, I think uh, people view uh, America as uh, this, this, this thing that people view and react one way or another, but what we do and how we help people or hurt people really makes a huge difference in the world. And I think that's really the number one thing that I gained and, and why I always dabble in my back of my mind is, do I one day want to be a politician? Do I one day want to do something bigger in government? And, and, and then I look at our elected, our elected officials and I think, well, I don't really want to be like that and, and so I usually stay far away from all that stuff. But yeah, I think, but the worst part of it was just at basic, it's just when getting sexually harassed by the other guys are there trying to think they're all that in a bag of chips when they're really not in there. So it was just, it was hard to, because um, what happened was when, I, when we were running and we were, I can't remember if it was, it wasn't our final two mile run, it was uh, one of our yeah, no, it wasn't. A, this was on the third or fourth week, I think. Gosh, I can't remember. Um, but at the time, you know, they all look alike because they all have really short hair, and the only distinguishing factors between the obvious of skin color or eye color was that each squadron had uh, different armbands that they would wear. And so, and uh, I, I used to be a runner in high school, so, you know, I, running for me wasn't an issue. So I was doing my run and I ran past this one group of guys and uh, he, they made some inappropriate comments. And you know, um, that, uh, ironically, that was one of the things that they had just beat into our head like two days before that was about, you know, sexual harassment and don't take it, you know, and if it happens while you're here, report it to one of the superiors. And, and so uh, I did after my run was done and uh, and uh, it was one of the most embarrassing situations now that I think about it. I was mortified, and um, he, the TI, took me over to the guy's side when they were doing, like, the sit-ups and the push-ups and the pull-ups and all that crap, and he wanted me to pick out who it was, and I was like, hell, I don't know. He was wearing a red armband. That's all I remember, and I think he maybe had blonde hair, but... Hell, I don't know. He had a buzz cut, <laughs> and like I even told the guy, I'm like, "Look, I'm sorry, but they all look alike." 
And, you know, I mean, it wasn't like I stood there and stared back at him as he was yelling at me about my ass. I mean, <laughs> but that was, yeah, that was, that was not fun. But, yeah, so, yeah, I kind of learned to keep my mouth shut after that, sadly, because, you know, it's like you didn't want to, I felt like they didn't believe me. I was in San Juan, Puerto Rico. I had, I was in communications. I was communication center supervisor and uh, the ship was at Liberty. And all the ships, all my radio men were ashore. I had the duty, went over to the communication center, picked up the flash message that President Kennedy had been assassinated took the message in, woke the captain up, thought I was drunk, was going to throw me in the brig, because <laughs> I told him, I said, the president just got shot, and he said, get the hell out of here. <laughs> he, and then he, the only time he ever apologized to me for anything, we didn't always get along, we didn't always see eye to eye, but I was the first, I was the first person on my ship that, that carried that flash message. Oh, well, I, wa I was in total disbelief. I, at, at first, I, I had to really look at it and went, actually went back to the comm center and I said, is this for real? And the guy said, yeah, he, wa he had tears in his eyes. And it was, a, it was a very, very dark day for us. And we called everybody back to the ship, went to general quarters. We didn't know if we were going to get underway, go blow something up or what we were going to do. We had no idea who attacked the President of the United States, how it happened. We didn't have all the details yet. So, uh, so, so uh, it, was a, it was a difficult, difficult job to hand that message to the captain. It, it really was. my perspective of the world? Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know if this is what you're talking about or if I'm, um, but I guess the biggest takeaway for me after serving was to never take anything for granted, um, especially after being in Iraq, you know. Um, at one point, we were down to one bottle of water per soldier, so we couldn't even brush our teeth, you know. Um, we were told, you don't do anything with that water, but drink it, you know? Um, so, I mean, at, at, at one point, water was uh, even very scarce. Um, we had nothing but MREs to eat for months. We had no refrigeration, no cold, anything cold, uh, no uh, toilets. I mean, we were digging holes to go to the bathroom. Um, I, early on, we, we didn't even have porta potties, you know. Um, we we had no air conditioning, and you know, and I was at a communication company, so we actually had phones and internet when everything was set up and working properly. Um, it was shoddy trying to call back to United States, but we were able to occasionally. Um, and I mean, we'd go out like out of base. Um, I was attached to the 101st Airborne um, in Missoula, and they were buying things to like help renovate businesses and hotels. And I went with them a couple of times, and they were buying things like you know computers and furniture, that kind of thing. And I mean, you'd see kids three, four years old working at a newspaper stand or like their uh, uh, parents' deli, you know. Um, with no shoes on, <laughs> wearing the same clothes every day. Um, I mean, early on, we didn't even have showers, you know. Um, 
So, I mean, even now, like, I'll be brushing my teeth and I'll think about, you know, Iraq. And um, I just, I don't take anything for granted. Um, you know, a shower, a, a diet Pepsi that's been in the fridge and is cold, you know, um, the AC. Um, I, I think that people that live in the United States and have never served, um, these things, they don't think about it, and they don't think about how other people don't have it. You, um, so I, I do. <laughs> So <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. I obviously wasn't thinking about it a whole lot other than my, my father's preaching of presentation, interview skills, um, your best foot forward. So I went out, and this was after I got out of the military. I went out and I bought myself uh, a cheap suit, a dress shirt and a tie, and a pair of dress shoes. And of course, I'm a Marine, so those shoes were polished up real nice. <laughs> And this is how I walk into this home store. Suit, tie, polish, shoes. <laughs> and I'm looking for a job and an application. <laughs> and I get the application and I'm standing at the counter and you know back then it was that short one pager, I fill it out. And the uh, person behind the desk says, hold on, don't leave. And she goes and calls the manager up to review my application. And he looks at me. And he kind of looks me up and down. And because I have a suit on in this home store, right? And he says, look, you're sharp, and I'm going to give you a job, but you got to lose the suit. Look around at us and what we're wearing. We're in jeans and polos. None of us wear suits. <laughs> so I must have gotten beat red. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but <laughs> the good thing is I got the job, and uh, uh, I showed up in my jeans and in polo and everything was was good but <laughs> the humility runs a little deeper so you know i was a combat marine i was pretty highly decorated i had my jump wings and i was feeling pretty i i, I was a team leader and i had a little bit of leadership skills or so i thought at the time <laughs> um i really didn't know much much at all <sighs> yeah i was still pretty pretty green and wet behind the ears. Um, but uh, I thought, you know what, certainly I'm marketable. And what I found out, uh, being, <laughs> being a four-year listed service member, is uh, you, you've got some skills, you've got some discipline, you've got some focus, you're, you're, you're mission-oriented, right? You, you work well with the team. And that, that's probably, I was a grunt. I was what was called an 0311 in the Marine Corps which is a rifleman, a, a grunt, an infantry person. And, uh, but having traveled to numerous countries, been in combat and pretty highly decorated, I was feeling kind of prideful. And I thought, I'll certainly get a good job wherever I land. And the job I got at this home store, <laughs> it was as a cashier. <laughs> so the humility I had to exercise, I had to... I had, to, I had to remind myself of the main goal, and the main goal was to pay for my little apartment while I go to college, and you, you know, keep my eye on the ball. So I, I came into the service with post-traumatic stress, and I even know that, you know, I didn't even know it. Um, I was abused and abandoned. Um, and I had been in therapy my whole life that I can remember, but no one back then, no one, that wasn't a diagnosis, you know, post-traumatic stress. Um, it was just, this kid is damaged. <laughs> um, 
And people, sometimes you got some really good people that understood the damage, right? And sometimes you got other people who they went with the stigma. Well, once abused, once abandoned, that child's going to end up in the gutter and she's going to be abusing her and abandon her. And sometimes went even further to, oh, I bet she ends up in dr on drugs. I actually ran into one of my old caseworkers after I had both my boys um, <laughs> who I saw her at an Applebee's. I didn't recognize her. She, recogn she recognized me and walked up to me and was shocked and was like, I thought you'd be dead. My children were like four and two, or five and a half and two. And I was like, I just remember looking at her and being like, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know who you are. Who are you again? And she said her name and I was like, and she goes, oh, well, I was your caseworker when? And she named the time period she was my caseworker. And I said, well, that's interesting because I've never touched drugs in my life. So the fact that you thought I'd be dead by now astounds me because that wasn't part of my childhood, right? Um, and also, uh, you're an asshole. These are my sons. And just so your little brain can wrap around this, uh, I was like, I'm a fucking captain in the army. Thank you for all the support and encouragement. And uh, obviously the faith that you had in any child in foster care. You suck and I hope you don't do that anymore. <laughs> you know, it was, it was, I was, I was angry actually. I remember being so angry. I, I didn't yell, but I was real stern because I had developed that you know, very monotone soldier voice over the years, and I was an officer on top of that. Um, I remember saying it with such veracity that the table of people she was sitting at when she went back to it said, you should probably, you should probably just leave. Um, I think, I think, um, hmm. I think I would be seen as a successful transition of a veteran and, and I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that to be arrogant. I'm just saying like, I caught some breaks, you know, and I easily could have slipped into a lot of places where some veterans slip into. I think a lot of veterans are struggling with mental health and the unemployment rate for veterans is much higher and the same goes for veteran spouses as well. So if we're gonna ask 1% of our citizens to bear 100% of the role of being quote unquote defenders of our country, um, civilians that have never served in the military or especially served overseas <clears throat> just need to have some patience and understanding and to realize that it's 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 just it's i don't know what the comp would be you know nowhere else are you shipped out at 17 years old and thrown into cattle cars and then thrown out into you know and then screamed at for 10 months or 10 weeks, you know, there's, there, there's nothing like it. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing. So um, whether they were a failed veteran, and when I say failed veteran, I mean um, folks who didn't make it in the military and are, weren't successful in their career. Um, and there's a lot of a lot of successful veterans as well. So just as, as, as in any population, you run the gamut of who, what type of veteran you're going to, you're gonna come into. Um, you know, the word veteran, it's, it's, the bit word veteran is stamped on a license plate. 
and you drive around with that, that veteran's personality and who they are, their story, it's so wide and diverse that, that as, as a civilian population, just don't, don't, don't make assumptions. And as a veteran population, just don't, don't assume that others are gonna feel like you're entitled to something. I mean, uh, so yeah. There are people who go out, leave the military, and go in, into the world of business. And I don't, it's hard for me to understand that because the satisfaction you have in the military is working for something bigger than yourself. And working for, uh, I don't want to denigrate it or anything, but working for um, a, a, a profit margin, to me, just didn't seem very attractive, if that makes sense. Uh, and again, I'm not criticizing people who do it. But I realize I don't understand them very well, if that makes sense. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, my daughter's ex had, had, a, her, had a father who worked selling hearing aids, and he was a really nice guy, and I enjoyed talking with him. Um, but he. He drove a Mercedes with a big picture of himself on the side, you know, advertising his hearing aid business. And I, I thought to myself, I can't understand his world. I, I don't get it. So there's a gulf there. And boy, it sounds like I'm being critical here, and I don't mean to be, but going to work for the Army after leaving the Army made total sense to me. I heard this week of a really talented guy in our, in our organization is going to go work in business. And I thought, well, more power to him. He's a, a talented guy. He'll do really well. But at, at the same time, you know, there's part of me going, why? Well, well the answer is uh, he'll make a lot more money there. A guy as talented as he is will make a lot better money. And I don't criticize it. It is, it is just it is a world beyond my ken, if you understand what I'm saying. Boy, that sounds pompous. <laughs> I hope it didn't come off that way. Um, the military, military life has so many satisfactions that are hard for people to understand. But, but, but the, uh, the camaraderie, the uh, sense of purpose, the, the, uh, the shared, in some cases, the shared suck. Um, can be quite a reward, if that makes sense. <laughs>